Tonight, a closer look at the wildlife living the city life and what researchers are learning about animal behavior. And the sex in the city study, scientists are discovering that urban noise may have an effect on the mating patterns of birds. And then, the science of gluten-free. You may not have to skip that pasta after all. That's coming up next on Catalyst. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. This is Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. We often take for granted the wildlife that surrounds us, and we miss the complex ecosystems that are ever evolving. Scientists, though, are paying attention because in neighborhoods all across the valley, urban life is bumping up against desert life every single day, often in unexpected ways. It's fun. I mean, it's like, oh, a fox sighting. Most people around here are really excited to see it because I think it's a good sign. In the Maple Ash neighborhood of Tempe, not far from the busy campus of Arizona State University, the gray fox is right at home. They don't really have any enemies around here except, you know, if humans took exception to them, I think. I think it's great because as soon as I found out they climb trees, I was like, they're taking care of the roof rat population. And we've had a, a vast reduction in roof rats here. Any wildlife experience that you have, assuming you're not being eaten by a bear or something, it's a feel good kind of psychologically kind of thing, I guess. I think it extends the meaning of neighborhood in a weird way. I just saw it going up my driveway. Wild animals live across the valley. And while many residents welcome them into the urban environment, others are concerned citing the safety of their children and pets. So one day we were out of town and we have neighbors come in and help us with the chickens and collect the eggs and just check on things. And sadly, he found that the entire flock was wiped out. He called the police because he did not understand what, what could possibly have happened in all these years of having them. And throughout the day, um, another neighbor had called to tell us that um, she had seen a coyote. We came to the conclusion that a coyote had gotten in the yard and killed them all. So that was a, a pretty sad um, event. As the valley continues to expand into local wildlife habitats, researchers at Arizona State University are trying to think outside the box in order to better understand how to blend city and desert life. There's this, been this idea that cities are this wasteland. They're places that conservation of, let's say, endangered species or species that we care about can't occur in a city because it's going to be this human-dominated ecosystems, and those are, are, are spaces that we shouldn't care about conserving in terms of you know, broader species conservation. And I think that that is an old story because there's all these hidden spots around the city where nature is thriving. And I think if we can think about finding those areas, protecting them, or at least understanding them a bit better, maybe then we can try to make our landscape a little bit more friendly to the types of animals that may be under the radar for us that are living among us all the time. Dr. Sharon Hall and her team are a part of a National Science Foundation effort called the Long-Term Ecological Research Network. Since the 1980s, this collective of scientists has explored ecological patterns of plant and wildlife sites all across the U.S. and the world. In Arizona, the researchers are preparing to set camera traps across several urban and desert locations in order to study wildlife. The, the McDowell Sonoran Preserve, which is the area that we're in, is actually the largest urban preserve in the country. So it makes it really unique in that the species that we have in this area are going to be somehow adapted to being near people. Um, there's people almost all around us. There's airplanes going above us all the time. They're used to this noise and then the lights and everything else we produce. So, um, so what we're doing is actually looking more at how they adapt to that in, in the sense of how we can still connect two pieces of forest within an urban environment. So one of the things we're doing is setting cameras in the distance transect. So from the road, about five miles this way, and then from the road, five miles in the other direction, looking at as we move further and further away from the road, does the wildlife community change? And then the second question we have is, what's driving that change? Is it, is it the noise? Is it the sound of the road? Is it the developments that are over here on the side? 
and this will all help us understand better what's going to happen when these new developments come up on, on behind us over here. The cameras have been up for about a year and a half, almost two years now. Over time we're getting more and more cameras, we get more and more data, so it's become really interesting to see what we're starting to get. In terms of the wildlife we're seeing, we're seeing almost everything you'd expect to see here. We've got everything from puma to jackrabbits and coyote and everything else that is pretty commonly seen. We get a lot of badger, which is a bit unusual because badger aren't something we normally get in our camera traps, and so we're really happy to see that. So what we want to do is be able to provide recommendations to the Maricopa Department of Transportation, to the city of Scottsdale, on what they could do going forward to make sure that there's always going to be room for wildlife in, the, in their development plans. Also part of the long-term ecological research project is a desert fertilization experiment observing how the annual native plant community adapts to different locations and soil compositions. We have sites in 15 of our mountain parks across the Phoenix area, some in the West Valley, some in the urban area, some in the East Valley, and we are surveying the abundance and productivity of wildflowers that come out in the spring, right after our winter rains. Where we are today is um, a desert preserve in an urban context, so this is kind of right in the city, um, right near the city of Phoenix. And so is this desert different from deserts that are out farther away from, from an urban environment? We might expect that it would be because it, it's uh, experiencing more of those indirect effects, as well as people visiting with their dogs and walking and doing whatever else they're doing. We can set up this kind of square quadrat um, in exactly the same time every year because a big part of this project is um, seeing how things change over time. So this is a really dry year. And as a result, we see almost nothing in this plot. So here's a, here's a ghost from last year. Um, you can see that this, this guy got pretty big last year, and there's nothing even approaching that size this year. Here's, here's a little guy right here, um, and this is about the biggest that we're seeing at this site right now is, is this little one. Annual plants in the Sonoran Desert are a big component of overall plant biodiversity. Um, and they're important for then the insects, the pollinators um, that live in the desert as well. So, so there are some kind of implications as far as overall biodiversity in the desert. This sort of urban desert is what most urban residents are going to experience, right? You're, you're not maybe going to go out as often, drive an hour either way, and get to a, a more pristine desert. Oh, here's a little schismus. Yep, right there. The desert can be really beautiful, but if you only go to a desert that has lost a big component of uh, the species we would expect, then you're not going to you're not going to see that. You're maybe not going to have the same appreciation. So, what can we do to create harmony between ourselves and nature? I think that if we, as humans, are living in our cities and moving between cities and becoming disconnected from nature somewhat, I think it benefits us to have nature come towards us, so we can understand our relationship with nature in a much more close, intimate way, especially for kids. I think if we, if the kids really understand that in their backyard there are hundred species of different bugs and they know the names of those species, maybe the next time this kid goes out into nature she'll really understand that this is something worth protecting. Scientists have long studied how urban life, the stress, the congestion, the noise affects humans. But what about urban wildlife? Biologists at Arizona State University are discovering that bright lights and loud sounds may be changing how urban animals look and live. And those discoveries are providing insights into the sustainability of human ecosystems. We can get a window into how we're affecting our local environments in cities, for example, by studying how cities affect animals. Piers Hutton doesn't just bird watch as a hobby. He studies birds, their songs, and their colorful feathers as valuable clues to environmental problems. Specifically, I'm interested in how, how sleep plays a role. So basically, do these birds need beauty sleep? And so what I'm doing is I'm taking these birds into captivity and, and exposing them to a couple different treatments. So one of them is a treatment which improves their sleep, and one is a treatment which reduces their sleep. Because they can't move and they're secured, uh, this is the best way that we can prevent them from being injured and ensure the safety of the bird. These are the bands that we put on the finches, and they have a nine-letter code on them. And this nine-letter code is unique, so this will help us identify the finches when we capture them again from the wild. 
So once I have the bird in this position, it's called the bander's grip, I'm going to extend its foot. I'll take the banding tool with the band in it and I'm going to slide the leg into the gap in the band and then slowly close it. Once that's done, I can open the banding tool, check to make sure that it's not caught, spin it and move it up and down just to make sure that it, it's freely moving. And we can do this over the period that they're molting their feathers to look at how it affects their coloration. Colorful birds have historically been a favorite subject of biologists. Their diverse colors are bright signals of evolution and adaptation to environmental change. And in fact, it's really one of the first things that Darwin noticed. When he was looking at birds and the differences in males and females, he was noticing the differences in their colors. Color plays a big role, especially in the bird world, when it comes to mates getting together and creating babies. Males use it as a signal for females, and it's a very obvious visual signal for the females. It's actually very efficient in the animal kingdom because you can just look at another bird and be able to tell whether it's a good quality bird or not. A lot of that is not necessarily based on their diet, but based on how well that their body extracts those nutrients from the diet. So bright colors in nature are often sort of sexual signals. They're advertisements about one's health or about one's quality as a prospective mate. Those bright colors in animal tissues come from natural molecules called carotenoids. They are typically red, orange, yellow in color. Uh, they get their name and, and really some of the earliest studies on them are from carrots and corn. Mom was right when she said, eat your carrots and corn, eat your vegetables, they're good for you, they're good for your eyes. Uh, because these natural pigments provide a whole variety of roles in nature, including having health benefits to humans. Kevin McGraw is an ecologist at ASU School of Life Sciences. He is an expert in animal coloration and teaches students about bird adaptation to urban environments. And what we find is that city animals tend to be less colorful, less exaggerated. And that's led us down a whole research path to try and understand both how and why animals are less colorful in the city. What we do is we take these feather samples and we mount them on this black cardstock. And so the next step, we're going to use this machine, which is called a spectroradiometer, to measure what these colors actually are, because humans don't see in the same way that birds do. And it makes that fun noise. And what it's going to do for us is it's going to measure the reflectance of these feathers. And so this lamp is a standardized light. So we know exactly the light that is going from this lamp and through this cable and out the end of this pen tip. When I move this pen tip, you can see that this graph is changing. And what this graph is showing is the intensity of light that's coming into here as well and how that depends on the wavelength of the light. Longer wavelengths up here are like our reds and oranges, whereas down here are like our yellows. Eventually we get down to blues and violets. And down here are colors that humans cannot see, but that the birds that we study do. And so we have to take that into account. Their nickname for this project is the Sex and the City Study. And they've recently discovered some interesting trends but we found that males in the city are less red, they're more yellow. They're kind of like the, the color that females don't really like and that's indicative of poor health. And females as well are also less colorful. They're less likely to have any color at all. And when they do have color, they are also yellower. After Hutton disrupts the sleep patterns of his bird subjects, he expects them to show negative side effects to their coloration and mating behavior. His experiment will simulate the loud noises birds hear in city environments. Humans create lots of artificial noises in a city that either scare animals and lead them to move away or leave, or induce them to acclimate or, or adapt to those sounds. It affects their calling frequencies, which allow them to stay in touch over you know, foraging or social contexts. Uh, it affects their mating calls, which again cascade to who's attractive and who gets left out of the mating pool. One of the biggest challenges in my research is that there are not a lot of people that study bird sleep. We're just now getting to a point where we really understand the best ways to measure, measure sleep in house finches. Understanding hazards to urban wildlife could help us improve ecosystems for many animals, including humans.
by understanding the processes that cause some animals to be less healthy in, in urban areas or more healthy in urban areas. We can design cities better and in turn give us the benefits of, of a healthy environment. The label gluten-free is everywhere. For people with celiac disease, eliminating gluten is the only way to avoid serious health issues. However, as waves of well-meaning consumers adopt gluten-free diets, researchers are warning the verdict is still out on the connection between gluten and food sensitivities. And just because an item has a gluten-free label at the grocery store, it doesn't always indicate the food is healthier. Few foods evoke a sense of comfort more than a fresh plate of Italian pasta. Making pasta is something that I like. Eating pasta is something that I love. When Mario Vincitorio's family opened up his fine Italian restaurant in Tempe, the menu was filled with family favorite recipes. And if I were forced to pick one, I would go with the gnocchi just because I love making it and I love the texture of it and I love the taste of it. But the gluten in the whole wheat ingredients, giving it that taste and texture, is a serious threat for someone with celiac disease. Celiac and gluten intolerance were rarely mentioned when he first opened 15 years ago, but that has quickly changed. I'm not quite sure whether the uh, disease is progressing at a rapid pace versus perhaps some misconceptions out there about the disease. In just over a decade, the gluten-free food industry has ballooned to a $15 billion business, a statistic defying common sense. I was in the grocery store the other day and I saw grapes labeled as gluten-free, which is something that never had gluten to begin with. As the gluten-free craze grew, nutritionist Carol Johnston and her team at Arizona State University noticed that consumers were getting confused. Well, gluten actually is a protein, and it's a protein you find in wheat, barley, and rye foods. Gluten is one of the more important nutrients found in bread. It's a natural protein, and it's a great way to get protein, especially if you're a vegetarian or a vegan. Before opening her gluten-free restaurant, Julie Moreno says breads were causing severe pain for her daughter. She was nine at the time. She started having a lot of belly aches, and then she ended up having horrible stomach pains um, doubled over during the, during the night. We took her to the ER, and they found out that it was swollen lymph nodes around her intestines. It's what we call an autoimmune response. It's when your, your immune system attacks um, something that's not a virus or a bacteria. Only about 20% of the people are susceptible to autoimmune diseases. She blames all proteins as a food group, not simply gluten, the protein found in grains used in breads and pasta. This is proteins like in fish or soybean, those the high allergy foods. It's always a protein that is linked with the allergic response to a food. But with gluten-based proteins, she says fewer than 6% are the cause of an autoimmune reaction, and in fewer than 1% of those cases, the immune system will go after it. And then um, you'll have um, inflammation in your small intestine, and that's where the symptoms start. In those very rare cases where a doctor diagnoses celiac disease, gluten is off limits. Limited to gluten-free foods, Moreno began experimenting to find recipes her daughter could enjoy, and then set out to share those recipes with others. That was kind of my mission. We wanted to be able to give people that whole uh, totally gluten-free experience um, from appetizer to dessert. Today, nearly every restaurant offers at least one gluten-free entree on their menu. Anecdotally, it appeared that a lot of people were giving up gluten who didn't have celiac or even the, the non-celiac reactions. We were, we were thinking maybe there's something about not eating the carbohydrates that made people feel better. We were out there to see if we could actually record why people felt better, um, you know, measure it objectively. We also looked at blood glucose because, um, you know, it could be that the gluten products were making your blood glucose spike. Which is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, all sorts of other um, kind of illness. Over a series of months, Johnston conducted several gluten studies. First, the macaroni study. 
Replacing the classic Elba macaroni in a box with first a rice substitute, then a corn and rice blend, and last, a quinoa. And we were recording their blood glucose and insulin, and we were recording their mood states. We didn't know what we were gonna find. We didn't see what we expected to see. They found that the gluten-free pasta actually produced um, a higher spike in blood glucose than the regular gluten-containing pasta. Why did this happen? This doesn't even make any sense. Um, corn, which was one of the substitute ingredients, actually has a lower glycemic response. So we were, we were just quite surprised. What I learned was we need to focus on the ingredients that they're substituting because we did a follow-up study in just some nutrition bars. And at that time she was looking at uh, gluten-free cliff bars versus regular cliff bars and how that affected blood glucose. In the um, granola bar study, the gluten-free product had dates that was replacing the gluten. And it worked like a charm. Blood glucose was much lower after you ate the date um, non-gluten bar. But Johnston noticed without gluten in the gut, the body absorbs starch much faster. It slows the digestion process of the starch in your small intestine. And whenever you slow the digestion process, you're gonna have a slower entry of the glucose into the bloodstream. When you take out the gluten, automatically you're gonna have a higher glycemic response because you've lost that protection on the starch to keep it from being digested more rapidly. This is really important concept because you, you don't want your blood sugar to spike high. Even if you're a healthy individual, over time having a high spike in your glucose can create inflammation in your arterial vessels and it is actually a risk factor for heart disease. In a jelly on toast trial comparing wheat to gluten-free with rice and flour and a vegetable-based flour, they confirmed ingredients do matter. And unless a doctor prescribes a gluten-free diet... For the most part, there's no real rational reason to do it. If you want to have a more healthful diet, you know, eating lean meats and eating lots of vegetables, um, plant-based foods, low-fat dairy, that's where you're going to get your nutrients. And she says, in moderation, breads provide the body with B vitamins and iron. In fact, the American Diabetes Association lists stone ground wheat breads as safe to eat because they fall below 55 on the glycemic index chart. Even homemade pasta, when eaten in moderation, is on that list. I think the bottom line, though, with our research is we're looking at the ingredients and just trying to bring to light that not all gluten-free products are created equal, even if the carbs stay the same on two different packages. Like, take a step further, look in the ingredients, and see what they're replacing the gluten with. For the 6% who must remain gluten-free... This is not the most ideal restaurant for you to be in. As for the remaining 94% who continue opting to go gluten-free as a weight loss choice... I say uh, you're giving up good flavors, good taste, good texture in breads and pizzas uh, for, no really, for no really good reason, but that's me. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and thank you for watching Catalyst, our show about shaping the future, how research creates real-life results. And because our lives have new problems that science can solve, we'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University, advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good. Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.